this is one of those wonderful moments where I got about 40 minutes for some quiet time, which I, I love enjoy. I love spending um, uh, with a war game. Uh, there's a, a line from a film which I remember. It's a David Mummy film. I can't remember the line. And it goes something like, um, fun is something that happens to you, but an enjoyment uh, you make yourself. I'm paraphrasing it, but essentially it's that thing of where... Um, I could plop myself down in front of the TV and have sort of fun given to me, but um, with war games you get as much as you put into it from them. And uh, some war games you have to put more in, and you can get a lot more out of them, consequently. Some some of them it's not worth the effort, um, some of them it's easier to get in, and, and those lighter war games, they're sort of fine and dandy, but I prefer something with a bit more kind of crunch to it. Um, so anyway, back here to La Batelle de Schoengraber in 1805. And um, uh, I mean, I'm sorry about the lighting. It's best I can do at the moment. Um, and it's a bit difficult to see on the map. I, I gather that because um, we have a white map, lots of white areas, and then these, these lots of white markers. If you remember, these are hidden uh, Russian units hidden in the vineyard. Um, quite a few of them have been revealed already and in fact the Russians have taken two battalions as a, a completely lost um, from combined rifle uh, musketry and um, melee. Uh, the um, French are busy pushing into the, um, uh, the uh, vineyards. They have um, the Murat's aide-de-camp here has gone with this. Um, uh, with this battalion here, and they've taken some losses. So th the units that are, look might look really high, um, they're not really stacked. They've just got fat loss counters underneath them. But anyways, um, so this is a, a Russian... Uh, yeah, that's just a Russian... Yes, that's a Russian Cossack unit. And then there's a, a hidden Russian battalion there. And um, the Cossack came... I can't, I can't remember. He was hidden somewhere, but he came in. The other... Uh, Russian Cossack has moved over here to try and um, sort of delay these folks here. Um, you can see so the French are moving up like that and they've just had some fortunate reinforcements. Uh, Le Grand has arrived with um, uh, two uh, battery of cannons, um, two regiments of hussars and um, a regiment of line infantry there so um they might be pushing north so hence the russians have moved up here now um it's a it's the, the vineyard isn't proving as difficult as i thought it might be to push through mainly because um you know, because the the russian grenadiers are so so fantastic but it's also this system it's very kind of sweet and uh, um with the um fire combat you either get nothing or you get one hit. Um, rarely you can get sort of two and three hits. And uh, as we saw, the Russian battalions are only three steps um, strong anyway. And you see the uh, these are elite grenadiers. It's so six steps long, so they're a lot stronger than the um, than the Russians. And then the other thing being is that in general order they can bring actually more fire to bear than if they went into skirmish order, and they're allowed to be in skirmish or general order in the vineyard. So um, even in general order, they've, they've got quite a nice amount of firepower um, that they can bring forward. I can't imagine what they would be like in, in line formation, uh, but maybe we'll see that later on. Now, before I go and get my cup of tea and settle down to do a little bit of a move, I'd just like to speak about the the game a bit more. Um, I'm uh, on the um, so it's a five o'clock five in the evening game turn. So we've had three turns already. These um, reinforcements, French reinforcements, are waiting to arrive. I have to roll for them, and we've got a lot more arriving now. But you can see it's going to be dusk very soon. So the majority of the battle is going to be indeed at dusk and night, and uh, um. I'm wondering, are we going to get, we, we want to get here as the French and capture that, all the hexes thereof for a complete victory, at least some for a partial victory. There's a long distance to travel. And it's a bit reminiscent of some ASL scenarios to me, this game, in that you have um, 
very precise victory conditions and tight time scale of precise geographical victory conditions and a pre precise time schedule in which to get across so you cannot kind of go okay we're moving forwards at um a sort of sure pace and um hopefully we get there in time no you really have to think ahead say so how much time would it take us just you know on foot with no one in our way to get there okay then how many turns is that and how many turns can we delay and fight um so although the russians are very weak comparatively they do only have to perform a delaying action so um i think they're going to be essentially as the rear guard sacrificing their battalions just to slow um the um uh, uh, just to slow the French down. I don't think there will be any attempt at kind of a, a solid line of defence or, uh, you know, some kind of like counter-attacking, uh, you know, uh, mustering and then uh, uh, counter-attacking for something like that. I think it really is just going to be slowing the French down and when they come in here, do more, much the same thing but a, a less um, easy fashion than in the, the vineyards which are already slowing the... the um, uh, French down. It'll be interesting to see what happens when the French have got the open to move in and then the, the Russians are seeking with weak forces to slow them down. So that's where I'm at the moment. Now I'd just like to mention two things. Uh, so should have sort of maybe gone to them first but one of the things is that in the Premier Rules you have um, command um, which uh, sets up a, a short like hierarchy, three levels and the, uh, then the overall leader has a number of command points in which he can put um, subordinate commands in a sovereign or imperial command. That's the same thing depending on the side, obviously. Sovereign for the kings and imperial for the emperors, i.e. emperor Napoleon. The point being that um, if you, say, have two, two points, you can only put two of your commanders in a command whereby either they can, I think, sort of force march as reinforcements or enter into melee combat the rest of you can be in local command whereby you don't essentially enter into melee combat i can't remember all the details you can move about a bit or no command which is a bit risky and then there is a chance for individual leaders to get, get gain initiative and put themselves in uh, imperial or sovereign command but in this game it's in in the la battle de Schongraben, although it's using the primary rules it dispenses with um uh, that um, rule and in fact there's nothing in the series in the in, in this um, specific rules that talks about it. it just doesn't mention the command hierarchy at all so no command points no command radio no initiative spans are mentioned so I, I posted a reply on the um, marshallenterprises.me is it no labatal.me anyway the Marshall Enterprises website and uh, the same day, I got a reply from Dennis Spores, one of the designers. So it's very nice and quick. And he just said, look, we found there was too many exceptions, so we just ditched it. They should have mentioned in here that they ditched it. But anyway, they basically said, just go with the um, uh, rule number, what do they call it? Rule number eight, which they call something like um, the happenstance of misfortunes of war or something like that which is essentially the rule which says each side has 10 minutes to perform their moves. And that was a bit of a clarification for me as well, because I, I thought, I wasn't sure if it was each side had 10 minutes to perform their whole turn, which could be a bit risky, because obviously you have the opposite size defensive fire within that taking up part of your turn, but actually it's only the movement portion of your turn. So the charge, a cheval and movement, um, segments which are the first two segments of the turn and essentially what he said was give the Napo uh, the give the french full 10 minutes and the russians get eight minutes so essentially the command control problems the russians face uh, are um enforced in this by just giving them less time for me to think about what they do so i have been playing it that way and i found i haven't needed the whole 10 minutes or in the eight minutes so far perhaps because there's so few units on the map but and perhaps I should be thinking a bit more about what each side is doing. But it's nice to have those restrictions. I haven't used it before, even though I've played the game um, a little bit before. Um, so it's nice to, to, to use those restri restrictions and see how they work out. Now, there is one other point that actually got me quite incensed, and that was that, um, coming back to this rule set after a while, 
I was looking at them. Uh, each unit has a particular facing. It can be on a hex side or hex spine. And then they have movement. And there's I could find nothing in the rules. And I've been through them all. Um, I, you know, I skimmed through them several times. All the relevant sections looked in, in detail. Uh, how do you change facing? And there's nothing mentioned in the rules. So um, that was a bit of a bother. So I thought, OK, let's have a look. I've got... Um, two other options. One is, well, I've got three options. One is look at the re uh, regulations of the year or the Marie Louise, which are kind of more complicated version of these rules. But I thought, let's go to um, what the Premier rules are based on. And that's the standard rules from, this is from um, La Batal Talavera de Española, which um, is from the 1970s. And no, sorry, this is from Quattro Bra, which I'm not sure. I've only just recently got that. I think that's the 80s, maybe late 70s. Or um, the standard rules, third edition, which I got in the Talavera Espanole. And what I found was essentially the premier rule set is, it's apart from some changes in the graphics, it's the, and these rule sets are both exactly the same, except you know, kind of like different fonts. This is a third edition, so they must have made some changes, but they're obviously only minor, um, at least from my quick look through. But the Premier rule set is exactly this rule set with nothing changed in it except the command rules added and then things like um, numbering in the case sections so um, and an index. And I thought... And and, and in this, there's, again, so again, there's nothing about... There's, they explain facing, they explain how to move, which is just a very short section. And they don't say how you change facing if there's a penalty for it. Now, if you came from outside and there's no penalty mentioned, you probably probably wouldn't bother. You'd just say, well, that's right. I move and turn my units whichever direction I like, however I like. But, you know, coming from other games where you're used to paying a cost to change facing, especially a tactical game, 100 yards or meters or so per hex like this, um, you you left something is is missing, so um. I was quite uh annoyed by that, and um, how did I resolve it? Oh gosh, I have to confess I can't quite remember how I resolved it, but but here is this is the rules from Quattro Bra, the movement. That's the whole section. That's a different section, um, movement. It just says. You move the number of hexagons up to the printed number on the counter. You have terrain restrictions, tactical organization restrictions, tactical blah, blah, blah. And they're nothing to do with facing. And then all formations would begin, blah, and then something about cavalry, nothing about facing. Now, this one from Espanol Talavera has got something about movement and orientation. It's always to the front orientation. You can turn around, etc. Movement and rotation to as you enter the new hex, the bottom of the counter moves. So it substitutes orders in a new direction. It must so, but again, so it doesn't. So you move and then you orientate. You move, you orientate. But again, how much can I orientate? Can I turn, you know, sixty degrees, ninety degrees? Okay, hundred and eighty. Um, and then I found something somewhere else. So then in the Marie Louise rules, it says units may change facing any number of hex sides without expending any movement points. OK, so again, it was in the standard rules, third edition. Um, essentially, you can change direction as much as you like, as long as you have movement points left. So essentially, the last hex you move into, you cannot change. If it's your last movement point, you cannot change facing. Any other hex, as long as you have movement points left, you can change facing. But it's, again, it doesn't. There, it doesn't say as much as you like. It's just implied. Sometimes these ne things need to be spelled out. Well, you know, we have sort of other things in our head telling us otherwise. But anyway, I was really incensed because basically I found that these standard rules, third edition, have more detail on movement that was essential for me to understand it than. These standard rules, not even third edition, and the premier rule set, which is um, now, it's now, it's, you know, like 2016 is their latest iteration of it. Nothing in there. So I thought, ah, why did they go back to standard rules, not even the third edition? What's wrong with these? I don't know. 
So that really annoyed me, but um, I sorted it out in the end. But um, I hope if anyone else plays these games, that clears it up for them straight away if they don't have the standard rules. Essentially, you you can change facing and hex as much as you like, um, except if you have to, don't have a, any movement points left. So you always need at least one movement point left to change facing. So the last hex might be uh, no change of facing, which clears things up and it seems sensible. Um, it, it, and something like that, it can't be expected to, to be done on common sense because you know, I hit some rule sets, they do have to say, well, look, use your common sense in cases of doubt, but something like that. How can I have common sense and what manoeuvres are possible for, uh, you know, like a 19th century um, battalion or regiment of hussars versus um, light infantry? I don't know how they performed, what they could do, what was possible, and I assume that the designers of the game have some insight into that because they have studied it. That's why I'm going to them. Um, you know, for um, informing my enjoyment. I, I don't want to play a game where it's just like a fantasy, um, where I feel like it's just a fantasy and I'm making it up as I go along. I don't want them to be able to turn around willy-nilly if that was not possible for them to do so. If it was, then fine. But then that does raise another question, because, for example, so, so in this rule set, it's possible for them to do something which in other rule sets... Uh, for sure, um, it wouldn't be possible. They wouldn't change face, and they would spend movement points to do that. And so, you know, there's a penalty there, which isn't here. So it's interesting, you know, again, the designers, they've made choices they don't fully know. Obviously, they think they're using their common sense. I don't know. I just need a bit more information. Um, okay, so enough of that insensation. Uh, and um, here we have the situation, and let's get back to it.